sorry, we've done a bit of a back and forth. What I want to be able to do today is primarily start off with the first unit, which will, you know, obviously help us understand, you know, the key things or, or you know, which kind of encompass the tourism and hospitality industry. So um, before I start, you know, I think there are some that I'm going to discuss primarily to look at, you know, setting a bit of a foundation to understand, you know, basic things in terms of businesses, types of businesses, because what we want to be able to do is understand today uh, in this particular unit, when I look at the unit, the aim of the unit is to help learners understand what are the key factors internal and external that influence the business in tourism and hospitality sector. But when we talk about the sector in general, you know, what we're doing is we're talking about uh, from an overall perspective of uh, the, the whole industry or the sector as a, as a whole. So when I say tourism and hospitality, but what actually makes tourism and hospitality is what we need to study in this particular unit. So obviously there are organizations, businesses, different types of businesses which actually make up this sector. People who work within this or you know, um, we work within these organizations make up this sector. So whether you're working in a hotel, whether you're working in a bed and breakfast, you're working in an events team, you're working maybe primarily, say, for example, in any other related industry like airlines, you know, booking, uh, uh, say, for example, tour operators, things like that. You all, you know, all people are actually making this particular sector in terms of working within this, uh, you know, working within a particular business. And that business becomes a part of the sector. Now, the other thing that we need to understand while we study this unit would be to try and understand how does the business working within this sector gets affected. So if I give you a simple example and relate it to this, what we're trying to, what I'm trying to explain is if you look at Tesco's, you look at Carrefour, you look at Asda, Walmart, these are all, you know, large multinational, uh, you know, retail giants which sell different kind of products and services, grocery, food, clothing, things like that. Now, they constitute all these businesses, all these large businesses and, uh, you know, uh, organizations actually constitute what is called the retailing sector. Because in uh, this sector, uh, a retailer is classified as somebody who has a large brick and mortar model. That means they have large outlets or, you know, warehouses in which they operate and they have access to these warehouses when customers come in or, you know, places when the customers come in to buy their various products and services. Now, if I relate that to the tourism and hospitality sector, so tourism and hospitality sector consists of hotels, airlines, booking tour operators, events team, things like that. And these all then make up this sector. Similarly, when you look at retailers, you have suppliers, you have, you know, retailers, you have production, you have lots of, uh, you know, farmers. They are all a part of that sector because at some stage, somebody is producing something primary which is becoming a raw material for somebody else. And that finally processed, finished good lands up at the, you know, shelf where we buy, say, for example, if you buy twinings tea or you buy, you know, co coffee, you end up buying that from the shelf within uh, the environment, which is retailer or, you know, Tesco or carry for. So similarly, I want to be able to look at this within this particular sector, understand what makes this up, what kind of businesses, public, private sector businesses make this sector up, what is their role and how do they get affected by changes happening in the environment? Changes which are happening internal to the company or the organization would be called micro and the changes which are happening outside would be classified as something we know, you know, changes which are beyond their control and they also affect the business. A simple example, case in point here is Brexit, which is happening. It's a reality. It is affecting a lot of businesses because of the uncertainty, the climate, whether we'll be able to trade with Europe and things like that. So we will study some of these things in the subsequent learning outcomes. And then finally, the aim of the unit is that once you've completed this unit, you should be able to apply this information and understand this sector quite well. So when I say you want to work within a hotel, you understand that you work one, you want to work within, say, uh, this THM sector, which is tourism and hospitality management. But within that, you want to work within a hoteling or hoteling or, you know, say, for example, a hotel business. If you want to work within, say, for example, meetings and conferences, you understand that you want to work within MICE or, you know, the large events part of the business which drives a lot of traffic to, uh, you know, uh, say, even or, you know, uh, say, for example, a particular location and creates seasonal tourism or even, you know, year-long tourism. So all that 
understanding of what constitutes this sector, what businesses, organizations uh, constitute, what challenges they face, how they're classified as public, private, and what are the factors which affect them internally or externally is what we want to be able to study, you know, in this particular unit. Now, this unit will also lay down a bit of foundation in terms of, you know, giving you a background uh, primarily, not in terms of the origins of tourism as a, as a, as a business or as a, as an activity, but more so from a point of view of, you know, what um, drives the activities happening within this sector. Now, if you look at what I've done in the slides that I'm going to present today and obviously go through, I've looked at covering some of the key concepts today, which is to un make you understand. And obviously, um, you know, the idea is when I say make everyone understand is that we want to be able to look at key ingredients or key players within this particular sector. So the first thing that we look at is when I say what constitutes, you know, the THM sector, if I put this as a heading, what constitutes the THM sector. So here, tourism and hospitality management sector, what we are looking at is uh, there are lots of businesses, different types of businesses which make up this sector. So let's define business. Now business, as we know very clearly, is a, you know, is a set of activity wherein you are you're selling some products and services and the products and services in return when customers or consumers buy, they end up giving you or paying you a certain price for it. So it's a commercial activity. Business is an activity which is a commercial activity wherein an organization, individual business is in the process of selling its goods and services. And in exchange for that, you make or you get money. And the whole idea of setting up a business as an entity, as an organization is that you want, you want to make profits from that commercial activity. Now, in travel and tourism, when we look at, and if I relate businesses now to travel and tourism, what we do get to see is that in travel and tourism, uh, there are lots of different types of business organizations which uh, make their livelihood, uh, you know, when they offer products and services within this sector. So when I named organizations like hotels, con conferences, tour operators, airlines, you know, events team, they're all working within this sector as a business and they offer certain goods and services which allow them to, in return, make money, and that is basically profit or wealth creation for that organization. And there is an exchange, in a way, you can say, of products and services. So if I have something to offer, like uh, I'm, uh, I, I own a hotel or I run a hotel, then in that case, it's a, say, 50 hotel. If you rent a room uh, for a night or for a, uh, for a week, you are in exchange going to be paying me, you know, certain rent or, you know, and that rent will cover the cost of uh, providing you the amenities in that hotel. So, for example, a coffee shop, a restaurant, a swimming pool, things like that, you know, laundry and all that. And But at the end of it, I will also in return, uh, you know, make some margin and that margin will constitute towards being profit that I make from that activity. Now, when we look at different types of there are obviously within this sector different, you know, in numerous different type of activities which will be done by business organizations or businesses or companies which actually offer these products and services. Now, when we get into this, let's understand what type of organizations or businesses make up this. So if I give this slide heading, what type of businesses make up this sector? So in this case, what we are looking at is the basic, very basic, uh, you know, uh, classification would be the sector is made up of private and public sector companies. So private company, which is a limited company, limited company guaranteed by shares, a company which could be owned by members of public, company which has flotation on a stock exchange. And then we look at public sector companies, public sector companies, which means primarily the, the controlling part, the majority of the controlling aspect of running the operations of the company, the ownership lies with the government or a semi-government organization. And when you look at organizations like IATA, you know, when you look at some of the um, uh, bodies, which are compliance bodies or organizations which maintain compliance, set law and legislation within the sector, those bodies tend to be normally, you know, public sector bodies or bodies owned by, uh, which are owned and run by, you know, government control. That means, these organizations would set policies. These organizations would also, you know, in certain effect, offer products and services. And a good example of 
normally we see most of it in the developed world as private private sector or private companies so when you look at a hotel chain when you think of uh, accommodation when you think of tour operators when you think of airlines when you think of you know events teams you think of you know big large events which happen some of these events and some of these organizations running and offering these products and services i would say majority of them 90 95% of them are basically private sector but if i have to look at uh you know just look at putting a bit of pressure and uh, thinking and put my thinking hat on and say okay what are the organizations which would be classified as public sector so one i thought of uh, which i named earlier was that you know these could be organizations like ita or any body which is a compliance related body which creates policy law legislation which will be in public sector but sometimes when you look at uh, um you know let me think of an example so when i say yes i i think i can think of one here is when you look at certain countries um not particularly in the developed world but i know that british airways for example uh you know was owned by the state but i think in the early 60s or 70s uh you know the privatization started 70s 80s and margaret thatcher was in and obviously at some stage you know the shares of british airways you know uh you know obviously this airline went into private control but there are still a lot of countries which have their national airlines that means uh, you look at railways for example you look at airlines for example you will see that some countries have national airlines wherein that is primarily in the control of uh, you know the government so they are still public sector enterprises but they offer and become a part of this sector which is tourism and hospitality management because they are able to they are one of the uh, you know essential cogs So if you look at transport transportation within the hospitality sector is quite big if you have to travel go on a vacation go on say for example um when i say you know vacation or you have to go yeah one of the points which obviously um you know justin is making is yes public sector bodies could be bodies which are regulated by and in some cases you will look at that these bodies primarily you know are bodies which you know are in the control of the government because sometimes to do with national pride so sometimes when you see a lot of airlines and company you know countries developing countries or developed countries having airlines would mean that they have uh, what you call uh, you know the airlines under the government control now this sector like any other sector is made up of private and public sector organizations so what we understand this slide my idea was to primarily just explain that okay when we look at a sector whether it's tourism and hospitality you look at retail you look at manufacturing you'll have a combination of private and public sector companies running the uh, you know forming that sector they offer different types of services they have different types of roles private organizations might be looking at a role in terms of making profits by offering commercial services making the services widely available sometimes you will see public sector uh, you know why privatization happens in public sector businesses or public sector services is that they want to make it more competitive like in the case of uk again if i give you a different example like when we look at gas and electric you look at water some of these companies which were providing these services were privatized in the early 1980s 90s in order to do away with the state monopoly of you know controlling everything and that has meant that some of these services have become better they have become more efficient and they are uh, you know obviously because they are commercial in nature the companies who are running and providing these services are also making money in return for offering these services to us so a a a, a small summary slide which says you know organizations which are predominantly run by the government are known as public sector so in the uk if you look at national health service or nhs is public sector you look at other public sector enterprises like you know for example if you work within the military or you work within the army air force these are public sector enterprises sometimes you will look at um, in developed countries i think it's very difficult to find uh, you know uh, things like banks for example in most other developing or under developed country you will see the banks are state owned that means they are public sector enterprises but in most developed countries i think i can hardly remember if there is any bank in the uk which is state owned RBS was acquired Lloyds was acquired and bailed out by the government you know uh, during the financial crisis but the government has the intention to sell off its stake uh, at some stage when they can make profit in the 
uh, you know, um, in the stock market. But most of the organizations under the control of some sort of a public or a state body would be classed as public sector organizations. They have uh, their ownership, you know, of a majority of the government. And these services which these organizations provide are available to one and all in the country. That means there is no differentiation, distinction between who can avail of this service or get hold of this service. So here, not getting too much into, into this, but idea is to understand that, okay, the sector is made up of public and private sector, just like any other sector in the tourism and hospitality industry, uh, public sector also plays a very important role. And sometimes you will see that um, uh, it is the policy making, uh, things like we've covered examples of things like the London 2020 Olympics, which happened. These kind of events, which actually happen at the international level, are, have a lot of uh, participation and, you know, obviously efforts being put in by public sector, uh, um, let's put it this way, the officials working in the public sector, the government in particular, because they are done, because they typically are also helping to promote uh, the tourism as an industry within a particular, you know, country. So when uh, the bidding happens for these events, like you look at the Olympics, the Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics, you will see that the bids are made at the top end level. It is done normally by the government, the money in terms of investment to create the infrastructure, stadia, you know, stadiums and all the other in, uh, infrastructure things which are required is primarily put in by the government. But at a later stage, this also helps kick drive regeneration, creates job opportunities, which provides greater good or advantages to the private sector as a whole and public sector as a whole. So there is an importance of public sector in driving tourism and hospitality related activities within a country within a geography. And there is no doubt that this is not possible without the participation of the public sector. Some of this happens at the policy level, at the law and legislation creation level, or even sometimes when you look at when uh, changes are to be introduced, then the publishing of white papers invites, you know, the public-private partnership to create a success uh, when certain pilots or, you know, certain types of projects are being done. So having understood the role of public sector, what we want to be able to do is understand uh, with, an, with the next slides is to look at what is that role that they play. You know, so for example, as I mentioned, key points like legislation, creation of policy, regulation, so that consumer rights are protected. Sometimes seen that uh, what happens is that if you book a holiday and the operator goes into administration, you need to claim your refund. So who comes into play or what public sector body actually comes into play to protect you and you sometimes see these holidays are at all protected. So some of the public sector organizations that I look at is IATA, you look at at all protected. Now these are organizations which have got created over the years which basically act as regulators or intermediaries between the public and private sector. They act independently but their aim is to con control and you know basically um, mediate and, you know, in, to a certain extent protect the rights of the consumers. Because if you end up booking the holiday and the operator goes into administration at some stage, you will feel that, uh, you know, that um, you need a refund. You, you know, you have insurance companies which would look at doing a refund. But the mediation effort of that typically is done normally through organizations which work within this sector, which are predominantly uh, public sector organizations and are tasked with, uh, you know, maintaining some sort of uh, regulation in order to ensure that the operator, the, um, you know, customer and the provider are all, you know, kind of protected from a point of view of, you know, when they look at providing these services. So nobody can be taken for a ride, let's put it this way. And I think what, what these organizations do is they mediate, they create a, a forum through which this mediation can happen. And that mediation primarily leads to, you know, everyone being, being um, let's say, everyone being happy and, you know, uh, uh, you know, feeling protected in the sense that they feel they have rights and responsibilities. And if something is to not go right, then they can go and complain, you know, um, kind of knock on that door to get a resolution or issues uh, for resolution of issues which needs to be solved. Now, 
if i look at what is public sector tourism now we know what is public what so far we we have looked at what makes this sector public private sector organizations businesses we know what they uh, how they are controlled what role they play but what we want to understand as just as a key key bit would be what is public sector tourism what if i say i know most tourism activities are funded by individuals themselves so they are private activities but there is a term called private sector tourism now what is private sector tourism now when you look at national parks when you look at for example um, you know um, things which are uh, uh, let's look at the example of national park itself they are basically for the um, they are state controlled but they are also offering certain types of services to tourists uh, you know which contribute towards tourism or increasing tourism in a particular area so when we look at public sector tourism it is concerned with national benefits which can be you know um, which can also bec become or bring economic benefits to the government so when you look at uk in particular and you look at say i look at a lot of palaces buckingham palace you look at you know lots of different uh, uh, you know edinburgh palace and things like that now they are what are called the national archives or you know they are nationalized assets of uh, but they to a certain extent also contribute money that means when you go to a particular place you have to buy an entry ticket and things like that so they bring across some sort of an economic benefit uh, you know to the uh, to the government as well so when we look at public sector tourism what we are looking at is that there are some of these national assets which are uh, historic which could be you know non historic as well but they bring in something called economic benefits in terms of both uh, money and also in terms of employment you will see that certain sites which are uh, within say for example public sector tourism are protected are marks and in some cases because these are protected and unmarks the government also have employ individuals to be either able to maintain them secure them and you know provide adequate facilities to be able to run them and you know maintain them over the years so this activity allows the government to um open some of these national assets uh, you know for the purposes of tourism activity but in return they get money and they also in return drive tourism to that particular area or that particular side of things so public sector tourism you know is basically something which is uh, if i have to literally summarize it would be that these are assets which are controlled by the government but there could be historic modern types of different types of assets these assets have economic benefits and these economic benefits is come in the form of payments employment and also you know in terms of increasing tourism in that particular area now there are lots of different types of industries which are also related with tourism so when i say when we were talking about hotel we were talking about restaurants you know a lot of different facilities these are the five different types that we classify so when i look at accommodations whether it's a bed and breakfast hotel they are all classified under you know accommodations when we look at food and beverage restaurants you know takeaways things like that they are all coming under that when you look at recreation entertainment primarily event side of things when you look at transportation tour operators airlines cruise ships railways road transport all will constitute towards zero transportation and a lot of these services that you avail you know booking of holidays uh, services which are related to making the travel would be classified as you know travel services so some sometimes we do look at it that in some countries obviously railways are nationalized so when you are using them for the purposes of travel uh, and you are traveling for the purposes of leisure vacation or you know some sort of uh, uh, you know tourist activity then in that case you know uh, you will look at what is called uh, you know travel services yes one of the other things is a good point which just mentioned is which i should have seen is that when you look at public sector they also help in regulating price fixing so some of the bodies that we thought of uh, and discussed earlier you know they look at avoiding state monopoly so sometimes when you see regulation is introduced what we do get to see is that regulation coming in allows uh, you know uh, certain bodies to be created which basically regulate uh, let's put it this way um, uh, monopoly to a certain extent so that no one operator has a monopoly for providing those services but at the same time there are lots of other bodies which are non or semi government bodies which look at this particular aspect of you know uh, fixing of price so when we look at banks 
You have uh, a lot of banks being fined during financial crisis because of LIBOR, the interbank lending rate, because they fix those rates. Similarly, when you look at tour operators, when you look at the airlines, they also are able to f- create these price fixes to a certain extent by you know working together and sometimes to, in order to break that price fixing or that monopoly, regulators which are predominantly public sector regulators or in the greater good of uh, you know the um, sector itself, these bodies like uh, you know IATA at all, some of the other bodies which also then look at you know breaking this uh, uh, you know monopoly. Now, let's briefly look at, you know, some of the things in terms of what are the characteristics of public sector organizations in particular. Now, we are not too focused on the private sector in the learning outcome one is because in learning outcome one, we are looking at private, public sector in particular. When we study the learning outcome two, we are going to be looking at private sector in a bit more detail, uh, you know, and how and what that uh, what role kind of role they play within that sector. So when we look at some of the characteristics, you know, public sector organizations, we are looking at things which are, uh, you know, sometimes intangible. That means you cannot touch them, but you, you feel or, you know, you kind of are able to uh, avail of that service. You look at things which are uh, which are fluid sometimes. And in some cases, when you look at one of the key experiences that you get when you utilize, for example, a particular service within the sector is, you always talk about experience. My, I had a good experience staying at that hotel, or I had a good uh, experience because of, um, you know, spending my time at that, uh, you know, vacation during during that vacation. You received customer service, or you received services which were either meeting or exceeding your expectation, and that is what leads leads you to say that okay, I, I was overjoyed or I was satisfied with the services that I that I received or the money that I spent. I was happy to spend that money because I was receiving the uh, you know service in lieu of the money being spent. So when we look at characteristics, what we want to be able to look at is what are the key things which actually drive uh, you know and make you aware of that this is what you know the uh, service would be. This is what the you know benefit for that uh, particular thing would be. So in this particular assessment criteria. What we want to be able to look at is, uh, you know, define some of the characteristics that we get to see within the public sector, which define, you know, the activities that people do within the tourism and hospitality industry. Now, when we look at the word characteristic, you know, itself, it basically is nothing but I would classify it as quality or, you know, typically something wherein you are, you know, you, you, you look at relating that to a person, place, or you know a certain uh, thing. So when I look at characteristics in marketing, we might look at you know saying four P's of marketing: price, product, place, promotion, and the other three P's like physical evidence, people, and uh, packaging. But when I look at characteristics in particular, in terms of the literal meaning, we normally look at you know kind of identifying something with a particular person, place, or thing. So if you say, if I have to ask you a question. You know what kind of a holiday you would want to take. Um, you would come up with the fact that okay, I, I want to go across to a beach holiday, or I want to go across to a you know a, a, a you know a nature kind of a holiday, or I would want to go across for a relaxing holiday. Now, why you are coming up with these three, four, five different types of things is because you are able to quickly relate what kind of experience you would want to have when you say that this kind of holiday I need to take. So when you say I want to have a relaxing holiday, it could be a beach holiday, it could even be a holiday wherein you're going to a resort, or it could be a holiday wherein even you are, uh, you know, going on a nature trail, things like that. But that uh, sense of, um, let's put it this way, uh, you're relating to a particular, uh, you know, type of activity brings across, you know, maybe touches a chord and it kind of brings across uh, typically, uh, kind of a belonging or a relation to that particular place, which allows you to identify that okay, this is something which I find which is going to be useful. So what we are going to be looking at is the characteristics of you know um, when we look at um, you know um, uh, things which when we look at in the public sector. So when we look at those things in particular, we are looking at in the hospitality industry. If I have to just uh, 
skip to one of the things that we look at, uh, one of the slides. So if I look at one of the slides. All right, so if I look at, say, one of the slides, um, which I haven't got it here, I'll come to that. Now, there are certain things which you relate to when you talk about, you know, the um, tourism industry. What are the things that you can relate to when you talk about, uh, you know, tourism industry? Can you think of what are the characteristics of tourism, uh, you know, when you think of tourism industry in particular? Yep, that's correct. But if you, mm -hmm. correct. But say, if I uh, let me rephrase that question. So if we, if I ask, say, for example, um, um, let's let me ask you uh, from a point of view of saying, okay, when we look at, uh, say, let's look at, you know, for example, we looked at one of the slides wherein I talked about, you know, the five different types of, uh, you know, things that you can do in tourism. Broadly, five different types. So you have accommodation, you have transportation, you have, you know, services that you avail or events and things like that. Now, there are loads of different things. Now, what is common in this particular, you know, um, classification that you, if I, if I give you a bit of a pointer, then what I would see is what is common within this particular sector is that if you're spending money, you are going out on a vacation, but you go out for a limited point of time. If you keep spending money, you can prolong your, uh, your vacation or your holiday. But there is a certain uh, amount of what you call. Um, so what I want to be able to hint in this case, give you a pointer, is that if you look at, um, you know, there is a time bound activity that you can do for the time amount of money you spend, if I put it this way. So if I say I'm going on a vacation, a week long vacation, that means you've kept aside certain amount of money. And that certain amount of money uh, buys you certain amount of, uh, you know, things that you want to do in your vacation, like your stay, your travel, your food, and a bit of shopping. But you budget for it because after a point in time, once that vacation is over, if you exhausted that four or five days and your vacation is over, what you what you do is you have to come back to normal in the sense you come back to work and you know your vacation you utilize that vacation. So what I'm trying to get to is that when I look at characteristics of this industry. What we do sometimes see is that there is a distinct, um, you know, uh, amount of time to which you can get these services because everything at the end of the day is related to what you call, um, you know, money or, you know, it's related to some sort of resources. So when I look at some of these services that, you know, you avail of in this particular sector, these services sometimes tend to be tangible and intangible. So when you have a good experience, you can experience it. You can actually, uh, you know, kind of relate to it. But this is not something that you can actually touch or feel or, you know, you can actually feel, but you cannot actually touch. But there are certain things when you look at tangible, that means I can touch these products. So if you've gone on a vacation, you've gone on a skiing, or you've done something in terms of any sea sports, things like that, then those products or those services that you enjoy are services that are tangible. That means you can, you, you remember, you can touch and, you know, you can feel and experience those services. But when we talk about the intangible aspects, some of the things that we look at is that these things can be, you know, sometimes uh, perishable products. So say, for example, if you opened up a bottle of wine uh, on a special occasion and you're having a holiday, once that bottle of wine is finished, bottle of wine is finished because that is a perishable product. So that means you've consumed a bottle of wine and, you know, some of these things in the, in, in terms of characteristics, involved that they are perishable products. So when you order some dinner, say for example, or you have food outside in a restaurant, you know, it, it is perishable product. Now, what I'm trying to get to is when we look at characteristics, and I, if I go back to how we define characteristics, what we look at are things which actually can do something, you know, um, some other entity. So when you look at characteristics of hospitality industry, you will see that there are certain things which are delivered as service, and these services could be tangible, intangible. And in some cases, when we look at intangible or uh, intangible services, that means we are not able to create a separation between two types of things. So when you look at, 
I think what I want to do is basically give you an example here. So if you go on a vacation, you stay at a hotel, um, and your hotel package that you've taken includes, you know, your uh, meals. Now, because that is included in the meal uh, in the package itself, it is sometimes difficult for you to say, can I look at a bit of a reduction in price, or can I get this uh, package without meals included? But if you go to most of the hotels, they have something called the American style hotels or where the breakfast is included, but that cannot be separated from, you know, the pricing of the room or the, uh, you know, the price of the room that you pay when you're on, on uh, when you're staying for a couple of days or, you know, you know, you're out on a vacation. So when we look at those things, you know, sometimes we have to understand that uh, when we look at uh, these characteristics, when we talk about characteristics in particular, we look at, you know, some of the things which are, from a point of view of tangible, intangible, some of the things which cannot be separated and they go across as one particular service. That means it is difficult for you to separate those services, um, you know, from, from a point of view, of, um, in, um, you know, an example. Okay, let me, let me explain that by example. I don't want to make it complex. You book a vacation. There are lots of things in the vacation that you will do. You'll have to travel. So there's a transportation component. You'll have to stay somewhere when there's a hotel. And then at some stage, you'll also, uh, you know, look at food and some of the other entertainment services. But when you take out a package holiday, all of these come together, right? You cannot say that I'll book my airline or I'll book the hotel myself or I only need the, you know, this thing in the package. No. Then in that case, the characteristic is that there is a seamless transfer or a link between the service which starts from booking to availing the holiday. And that is what is the characteristic of the industry. That means everything is so tightly glued together that when you try and book a vacation or you try and utilize a service within the sector, what you get to see is that everything is quite closely related. And that is what you know differentiates this from any other industry. Now, a typical example away from this would be if you buy a car, you do not have an obligation to get it service from the dealership that you bought it from. You can get it service from a local dealership as well. So there is no obligation there and the service is not tightly linked uh, when you buy a car to that particular dealership. Yes, to a company, uh, if you're buying a particular type of car, it is linked to the company, but you can go across to a different dealership to get it service as long as the company remains the same. But in the case of what you will see is that this sometimes becomes very um, uh, you know, distinct is that you cannot, uh, you know, differentiate between these services because it is a seamless way of providing uh, this service because it all in, is included in one package. Is that clear? Now, I'm going to go across to something towards the end, um, you know, which talks about what are the challenges which the public sector faces uh, in, in today's environment when we look at, uh, you know, the um, hospitality industry. Now, there are five challenges that we normally see which the hotel industry faces. Now, within the hospitality, I'm just looking at the hotel. One of the challenges is cleanliness. You know, first impressions are quite important. So when you look at booking a hotel, you look at classification like two star, three star, four star, five star, or seven star. Why do you think these classifications over the years have come in as a system? Is because they expect that uh, in order for them to attract customers or consumers to come in and stay at that particular place, they need to be able to differentiate. And in order to differentiate, differentiation has led to the creation of this star system. And that star system, uh, you know, whichever service, whatever service type you look at, one of the key things which comes across is cleanliness. Now, with the onslaught of modern technology now coming in, technology we see is as, as one of the challenges because you are constantly in the race to update. Like sometimes when you go and stay in a hotel, you will see that the hotel room provide you a 32 inch television, uh, but it's not a flat television, but you will see some hotels try and attract more premium by raising prices, by pro providing, you know, better services. And they would have a 40 inch or a 45 inch uh, LCD television in the room. There would be things uh, which you'll have access to like room service and other bits. So when we look at five challenges, one is cleanliness, the type of service and experience that the hotel is able to provide technology. You look at, uh, you know, service. So for example, when you order food at restaurants, you look at ordering, uh, you know, um, in, in say from a point of view of, you know, uh, room service, 
availability of a 24 hour coffee shop, things like that. You look at these kind of service, uh, you know, parameters when you look at one of the challenge. Now, apart from that, sustainability, because you have to sustain the activity over a point in time every week, every day, every month, and, you know, for a number of years. Now, what I've done is I have looked at detailing out some of these challenges in one one slide. Now, when we talk about uh, the five challenges, now what are the challenges in particular when you look at hotels are facing? So sometimes you see growth in the sector. You know, if there's a recession in the economy, you will see that tourism gets affected. So sometimes there's an overcapacity. Sometimes when you look at, you know, hot spots for vacations, they are only uh, spots for vacation. So when you look at Ibiza, you look at Mallorca, you look at some of the popular destinations in, in Europe, you look at Marrakesh, you know, these cities <coughs> have essentially become hot spots for tourism. Now, if they don't have tourism across the year, you have a problem in that particular area is because the uh, livelihoods goes, the, jo the job economy suffers, and also in general, the economy of that location suffers. So when we look at some of the challenges, what we do get to see is that uh, sometimes there's a growth number of years that this sector sees a growth, but if there's a slump which comes, it could come because of overcapacity. That means too many hotels in that area. They are not able to sell out their rooms. Sometimes you see that the tourism becomes seasonal. So in certain months of the year, there is no activity, and that is that means there is no livelihood, there is no uh, you know activity happening uh, in, as far as you know attracting the business is concerned. And as for not the least, in some cases you would see that the if the um, location is primarily a tourist location, it also creates a bit of a nuisance because it produces a lot of waste. So when you look at modern cities like Barcelona and you know some of the other cities in Europe, they are now suggesting to the government that you know the number of tourists coming to the city need to be restricted because it leads to the creation of a lot of waste and you know that. Uh, you know, local residents who are a part and parcel of that city have been there for generations. It, it's become something which is, uh, it's become a bit of a nuisance for them. So when you look at some of these challenges, these are challenges which the public sector, the private sector needs, needs to tackle. But in general, some of these challenges, when I look at challenges of waste, when we look at overcapacity, you know, visa system, for example, um, Spain has become the most visited country now uh, uh, in the survey as per last year. It surpassed the U.S. So about 80 million tourists visit Spain every year. Now, this is putting tremendous pressure on public infrastructure. The government is happy, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, there is a certain set of things which the public sector derives in terms of economic benefits. So the government is happy issuing more visas to tourists or visitors coming across from different countries. But what that is creating in general, which the public is seeming uh, public, you know, when I say public, in people in Spain are seeming to rise against, is that they feel that it is putting a lot of pressure on the public infrastructure, roads, you know, public transport, things like that, and it also creates the problem of say, you know, people moving from smaller towns to larger cities in in uh, in search for employment. And that leads to overcrowding in certain cities. So Barcelona is such one one such example. And having said that, you know, it, it brings a lot of problems when people move. They look at taxis and other kind of livelihood. And when you look at that, it leads to, say, for example, a problem of transportation. Now, some of the other challenges, very briefly, that I want to just put a few words to for the first learning outcome would be technological. So when you say, when I've given you an example, a lot of hotels are now under consistent, uh, you know, upgrades every two years, three years to look at thinking, providing things like Wi-Fi, flat television, televisions, you know, USB ports, because everything that people now carry across are chargeable through USBs or some sort of USBs. So this is a technological challenge for, you know, uh, hotels. You look at room service, you look at, you know, the number of channels that you get in the room. So there is a constant surge in terms of updating technology which is required to be done, you know, at the hotels. Let's look at political and security challenges. Now, because as these places are becoming quite, uh, you know, uh, frequented, you see that the government side of things, uh, public sector side of things, uh, has to play its role in tackling, you know, security problems. Things like when you look at, um, 
you know, sometimes when you look at big events, there's a lot of security around those events because it is to do with public safety, it is to do with, you know, security of the individuals attending those events and also people coming in to attend or, you know, participate on the, in those events. So public sector plays a very important role in security side of things. And these could be, you know, to reduce crime, to look at reducing terrorism now. There is a separate branch currently now being studied, which is tourism and terrorism. So, you know, these are which public sector, because the, the policing, you know, special forces or you know, looking at uh, intelligence is an important part of, you know, uh, uh, one of the challenges wherein the public sector steps in, not the private sector in general. So when you look at a large event like Olympics happening, there's a lot of security around airports, most of the key locations where the events are happening, but that is all being done by the army or, for example, the police in some cases. But when it comes to an individual hotel, the hotel will have its own security and own, own system of CCTV and other things. But the contribution of public sector is more in general because they have to facilitate that across the city. So the role of public sector is slightly more in this case when we look at uh, you know politics and security challenges. Now, one of the other challenges that we have is, I would say nicely summarized in this uh, uh, you know pick that I was able to get is that there's a lot of staff, uh, you know, um, turnover, which tends to happen, uh, you know, primarily in, uh, in in terms of jobs when you look at. It. So when you look at um, just one point, I think Justin mentioned is that, you know, crime prevention, which is obviously regulated by, you know, public sector agencies and the role of the government there is obviously quite, uh, you know, very correct. That That is quite correct. So that is one of the challenge which obviously the public sector steps into, you know, kind of mediate and, uh, you know, control. Now, so when we look at labor or, you know, staff turnover in this industry, uh, there's a lot of staff turnover which happens. And in the last unit, we looked at that, you know, uh, this industry spends on an average the highest amount, which was I think about 3,300 uh, some dollars per employee to train them, to develop them before even they start working within the uh, you know, business or within the um, uh, uh, a particular type of business within this sector. Now, there are challenges hotels in particular have, which is to look at maintaining bookings, to look at utilizing unutilized capacity, filling the rooms up and things like that, which are also key challenges, you know, uh, when we look at this particular sector. Now, seasonality of, uh, you know, tourism. So when you look at peak seasons, why does the public sector step in is because when you see that uh, you know policy changes are happening or large events are being created in terms of a calendar, a public events calendar or a national events calendar. That is where the public sector again plays a bit of a role is because they want to do away with the seasonality of tourism or seasonality of uh, you know customers coming in to visit a particular location. They want to drive tourism in so it becomes you know an all year round activity. So sometimes you will see policy making. Sometimes you will see some of the things being proposed by uh, the government in particular. They look at doing away with the seasonality of, uh, you know, the um, uh, in, in this particular point of seasonality in the hospitality industry so that the businesses, organizations which are involved in offering these products and services can do it all year round rather than just a number of months because it affects the economy, the market, you know, the uh, overall, you know, well-being of the economy in particular. And last but not the least, when we look at one of the biggest challenges that this particular industry is currently ever evolving, is ever changing. There is a lot of change which is happening within the industry because of the expectation of the customers are changing. So customer is king. We go back to that same situation where we have heard this term in marketing terminology that customer is king, customer is always right. So when you look at their preferences and as more and more people now begin to travel from developing countries, air travel becoming more affordable, uh, you know, tourism as an activity growing, uh, what we do get to see is that the constantly changing expectation of customers keeps this sector almost on its toes. And that is where, you know, a lot of innovation is required when we look at, uh, you know, uh, holidays being all inclusive, uh, creation of water parks or, you know, theme parks within the hotels or large resorts in order to keep them in to spend more within a particular place. And the idea is why these are things which are coming through is because the introduction of say activities which happened about two or three decades back, 
So these type of activities which have been introduced are introduced because of the changing expectation of the consumers. So, so I'm going to stop here. There. So basically, a lot of this is to understand, uh, you know, the learning outcome one. And in this, what we want to understand the role of public sector in particular, uh, that what the public sector uh, plays and contributes towards the THM sector. Now, this presentation will be uploaded onto Moodle, and I'm also going to send you a bit of a handout for you to read. Uh, there will be one or two uh, journal papers which will explain some of the things that I've covered, you know, using slides in a bit more detail. Is that okay? Good stuff. Justin, are you okay with that? So he's joined uh, new, uh, and he starts off with his first unit. So I think he's going to be regular on some of these sessions. And we have got another learner who's joined, uh, Khalid. So there are going to be three of you who are going to be now going. So obviously, you are slightly ahead. But uh, the idea would be any other further units that we cover, you know, we'll try and synchronize the time across the three of you. So there's a bit more interaction happening, uh, you know, as far as the sessions are concerned. And obviously, you get to network a bit as well. Okay, that's brilliant.